Welcome to. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Libraries in Response, session 73, not seven, forgive the typo there. Conversation with Corey, uh, April the 6th. Uh, this actually is our 73rd uh, in this series that we began in March of 2020 in response to the pandemic, as in what's going on and what does it all mean? uh it that seemed like a really long time ago i don't know if everybody else has the same experience of time warp of uh, how long it's been since something happened you think it's been like three years it couldn't possibly be three years we've been locked down for three years practically anyway we've been uh migrating through a number of different crises that have gone on since then the health crisis social crisis uh, uh political economic and uh and the major crisis that we're all facing the the climate crisis. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network, uh, uh, open uh, collaboration of, of uh, tech innovating libraries around the world. Uh, and our partner in this series and our host today is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, uh, in The Hague with Stephen Weiber there at the controls. Uh, this is our session today, uh, correctly identified as session 73. Uh, with a special guest, Corey Doctorow, who I think is known to all of you here, or maybe you wouldn't even be here, but nevertheless, uh, we're really happy and glad, Corey, that you made the time for us today, and uh, we're looking for uh, interesting interaction. Uh, interacting with Corey will be Stephen and Jonathan, who are on today, and we'll, uh, we'll all be also be watching for any questions to put into the conversation. Um, Corey mentions the modern robber barons, and it got me thinking, I wonder if, if four or five is a natural number of robber barons. Do they kind of max out at that number? And so I went back to, you know, the kind of the first use of that term and, and, and found this, which it kind of confirms that number. Uh, but also, uh, interestingly, Carnegie noted among those is the, you know, this, the, the richest, guy at the time uh, for steel, you know, a critical technology to, to do all the building that was going on at the time. But then he became philanthropic, uh, what we would call philanthropic. I mean, we don't know what his motivations were. Was it he thought he actually felt guilty, unlikely, but he maybe felt like he needed to sort of repay all of his good luck and and do something for other people. He also was notably someone who had benefited from libraries himself and, and thought that it was it fit his philosophy of, of self-help and self-development. And the library is a place, of course, that, that offers you the chance to do that. Are these our modern uh, barons today? I mean, it looks kind of a similar list. These are really the dominant industries, the dominant companies in, in these information technology industries. Uh, but as I mentioned, you know, uh, not all of their activities are, are negative and that by 1920, Carnegie libraries represent half of the public libraries in the United States, which is impressive. Um, now we are, you know, in this era of libraries under siege, which is just so surprising on one level. Uh, we'd always felt like libraries are, you know, apolitical and not in the middle of the uh, of the uh, the controversies surrounding, I don't know, much of anything. Uh, libraries are really, really popular. Half the U.S. population are active library users. And, you know, once a day or once a year, but they're they're library members, and um, which is a stunning number, uh, at least to me. But nevertheless, they are. Uh, but now they seem to be uh, facing all kinds of challenges and attacks. These are just you know, uh, a random set of, of uh, headlines and stories that uh, it, it, it's just, it's discouraging on one level, but, you know, uh, it's not totally surprising because it is pretty much, uh, you know, right out of the standard uh, autocracy playbook is to shut down open discussion. Uh, but shutting down things is really anathema. We think of librarians, and I'm speaking to most of you who are librarians, as you know, fairly modest people or, or moderate in their in their behavior, but once you start challenging specific rights like of free expression or for private inquiry, 
do you suddenly see, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the beast come out? I mean, somebody really uh, strongly held beliefs about uh, about these rights. Uh, and this is a display here. Couldn't help but, uh, you know, I would laugh if I if it wasn't, wasn't making me cry, you know, banning the Wizard of Oz and pop on pop. I mean, people are, are nuts out there. So, uh, So we are uh, back to our program now uh, with uh, Corey, Stephen, and uh, Jonathan. So with that, I will thank you all for your indulgence on this opening uh, remarks and uh, uh, turn it over to Corey for his remarks. And then we'll have Stephen moderate the interaction uh, with Jonathan and the rest of you. And I'll be keeping an eye on the chat. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so uh, I might uh, first have a, a procedural note. So the, the way to make a Zoom conference look natural is to stare directly into the camera, which militates against looking at one's notes. And so what I end up doing is putting my notes behind the camera over the Zoom window, which works great, except sometimes the connection drops and then I speak to a blank screen for 60 minutes and then look up and realize that my do not disturb mode phone has been getting messages for the last hour saying we lost you. I have the chat <laughs> visible in a corner of my screen. If my connection drops, please put something in the chat and I'll see it. That's just a, just a little little process note for this moment here in the early 21st century. Um, so uh, thank you very much for having me. I, uh, I stand libraries. Every writer is supposed to say that, but um, you know, I was a page, I was a cataloger. I'm now on the faculty at the University of North Carolina as a visiting professor of practice in the library school. Uh, I worked with Eiffel and IFLA at the World Intellectual Property Organization when I was there on behalf of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and indeed helped found access to uh, Information Africa with Eiffel and IFLA, which was an NGO based in Uganda that promoted open access and specifically um, organized African uh, uh, scholarly institutions to resist the calls by the U.S. Trade Representative to remove um, photocopiers and open access materials from university libraries. Uh, oh, someone's saying my audio level is low. Okay, let me let me just crank my audio a bit here. Oh, hi, Jolie, it's nice to see you. Uh, I have been having problems with Zoom and my audio lately, and I don't know what to do about it because every It's other pretty good, episode... Corey. Hmm? It's is pretty good. Better? Is that better? Okay. My, my, it's okay my for us. Is up now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, um, I am, uh, despite my youthful vigor, an old guy, I am now 51 years old. Um, it is my mm. job as a 51 year old to complain about how things used to be better. Uh, I have two artificial hips. I have cataracts. I am definitely in that role. And despite the cliche of someone of my advanced years saying things used to be better, I really do think things used to be better on the web. I think that we had a better internet when it wasn't just five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four. And the talk today is about how we got there. And I think it relates to libraries because it relates to the way that choke points have been erected in our information landscape and specifically what we can do about it. So I think to understand the degradation of our web, you have to understand the underlying dynamics of um, platform economics. So a platform formally is a, a service that offers something to sellers and something to buyers and connects the two of them. So, you know, the NASDAQ is a platform, but like so is Uber or eBay. You have, you have sellers, uh, drivers, right? You have uh, buyers, passengers, you have the platform mediating between them. And in platform economics, there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of playbook that we have seen repeated uh, in all of our digital platforms that have survived. Uh, the first thing that the platforms do is they allocate surpluses. Uh, surpluses is a word economists use to, to mean roughly goodies. Uh, since the great financial crisis, I've been really leaning into um, figuring out how to talk like an economist primarily so I can make fun of them. So, so these surpluses, these goodies are first allocated to users in an attempt to lock in the users. 
Once those users are firmly cemented to the platform, the surpluses are clawed back from those users. They're allocated to business customers, uh, advertisers, publishers, platform sellers, gig workers, creators, or performers until those business users are locked in. And then once both sides of this two-sided market are locked in, the platform scoops all of the surpluses up for themselves. Uh, I, I was just at a conference in Brussels on antitrust where one of the speakers, um, a, a commissioner for the European Union, said it's very hard to get people to care about this stuff. It's so dry. Uh, I have a way of getting people to care about it. I came up with a snappy name for this process. I call it enshittification. Uh, and in shitification, it really is why everything is genuinely worse these days. Uh, I'm going to walk you through a quick case study here, uh, and then I'm going to uh, uh, talk about what we can do about it. So the case study, it's just too, too obvious to pass up here, is Amazon. Uh, Amazon was at first very good to its customers. Uh, it subsidized goods, it subsidized shipping, it subsidized returns. And then it had these ways of locking those customers to the platform. You know, a social media platform has got a little easier. If you go on Facebook because your friends are there, then you can't leave because your friends are there and your friends can't leave because you're there. You're, you're you know, in, engaged in an act of mutual hostage taking. Uh, Amazon, it was a little subtler, it was a little trickier. So one thing they did was they sold people their shipping a year in advance. Um, that is a way of making sure that people only shop on, on Amazon, right? So Prime... Uh, is now in the majority of U.S. households, and most Prime uh, subscribers uh, start their search on Amazon. If they find what they're looking for, they don't go anywhere else. So that's one way to kind of lock people in. Another way to lock people in, of course, is digital rights management. So uh, I don't have to tell a library audience what digital rights management is, but I do think that sometimes uh, library audiences don't quite grasp the um, legal ramifications of DRM. So uh, Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act passed in 1998 makes it a felony to supply someone with a tool to remove DRM. And that is true irrespective of whether there's a copyright infringement. It's true irrespective of whether you are the rights holder to the work that is behind the DRM. So if Amazon puts DRM on one of my books that I wrote, that I hold the copyright to, and I give you a tool to remove that DRM so you can take your uh, your ebook, your audiobook off of Amazon's platform and divorce Amazon, move to another platform. I commit a felony punishable by a five year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine. By contrast, if you were to merely pirate that book, the maximum civil damages are $150,000. So it is more of a copyright violation for the author of a book to give you the tools to, in a non-infringing way, move that book from Amazon to a rival platform than it is for you to simply pirate the book, right? That uh, means that every dollar that a customer spends on a DRM-restricted uh, media file is a dollar that they'll have to forfeit if they ever want to break up with Amazon because all of those books are locked to Amazon's platform until Amazon decides to, decides to unlock them. It, you know, so long as there's a single copyrighted work, uh, cover with Amazon DRM, it is unlawful to supply people with a tool to unlock any of the works, irrespective of whether they're in the public domain from Amazon's DRM. So the users get locked in, Prime, DRM, also, uh, you know, the increasing sales on Amazon uh, uh, denudes the high street. There are fewer brick and mortar uh, retailers that you can go to. It's it's harder to shop somewhere else, which means that you you often have to buy things from Amazon. There's not anywhere else to go. So once those users are locked into Amazon, Amazon withdraws the surplus from them and gives it to the sellers. So the sellers get low platform fees. They get preferential terms. They get a very clean search interface. You know, if you list a product and its model number and I search for that product by its model number, that's at the top of the results. It's a huge sales funnel for uh, both uh, manufacturers who can go direct to consumer through Amazon or, you know, indirectly to consumer, but but not through a, um, a retailer, uh, another retailer that then sells on Amazon. And it's good for, for smaller retailers that use Amazon as their platform. Now, once those buyers are locked in and dependent on the sellers and the sellers are locked in because of, that's where all the buyers are, Amazon withdraws the surplus from both of them and allocates it to itself. So if you search on Amazon today, the first screen of results is ads. The first five screens of results are 50% ads. Um, 
of the remaining 50%, a substantial fraction are lookalike products where Amazon has used its uh, proprietary access to data generated by its own sellers to uh, clone its seller's products, go through its seller's um, manufacturing partners, and displace those seller's products by putting its own products above them. Now, Amazon has a, a $31 billion advertising business. And indeed, whenever people talk about monopoly and ad tech, and they say, oh, Google and, and Facebook have got this you know, durable lock on advertising, someone will always pop up and say, oh, no, no, no. It's possible for a new firm to enter the market. Look at Amazon. They've got $31 billion in advertising. But Amazon advertising is not like Google and Facebook advertising. It's not to say that those are, are great businesses with nothing problematic about them. But what Amazon means by advertising is that uh, in order to be at the top of the search results in the first screen, which is all ads, or 50% of the first five screens, uh, in order to get there, you have to outbid other people for that search term. So if you search for Duracell, the top result across the top of the screen is Duracell. That's an ad. Duracell has to buy that ad to be at the top of the screen. Otherwise, rivals of Duracell go at the top of the ad. In aggregate, $31 billion from sellers being transferred to buyer uh, to Amazon in order to be at the top of your search results. And the thing that is at the top of your search results when you search is not the best product. It's the product willing to spend the most to advertise, which is why it's so hard to buy uh, good products on Amazon these days. And it's also why Amazon discontinued Amazon Smile, which was its, its product where um, if you uh, started your search on Amazon, they would give a small fraction of whatever you spent to a charity of your choosing. Uh, the point of that was to get people to search on Amazon and not on Google, because Google will take you directly to the product. You type Amazon model number into Google, Google will give you the direct link, and then Amazon actually has to pay a referral fee to Google. Whereas if you go to Amazon, they can turn your attention into a commodity that they sell to their own sellers to degrade the process. So advertising is one part of Amazon's bundle of junk fees. All told today, more than 50% of the sale price of all goods in Amazon marketplace offered by third parties, more than 50% is, is consumed by junk fees. Now there's no such thing as a seller with a 50% margin, right? Uh, uh, unless maybe they're a monopolist like Amazon, that probably Amazon Web Services has a 50% margin. But like if you're selling widgets or you know, more importantly, books, you do not have a 50% margin. And so everyone who sells on Amazon has to raise their price. Otherwise they lose money on every sale. Now, the reason it's hard to determine that those prices have gone up is that Amazon imposes something called the Most Favored Nation Status Clause on every one of its sellers. And the way that that works is that the seller has to covenant that they will not offer goods for sale at a price lower than they are offered for sale at Amazon, including direct to consumer, which means that the prices at Target and Walmart and your corner store are all higher because Amazon is taking 50% of the price of its marketplace goods. They have to raise the prices everywhere. This is why DC Attorney General Ken Racine is suing Amazon for price fixing. So that's one way that you see surpluses transferred from buyers and sellers and given to Amazon. Another way is really important in uh, Amazon's uh, creative products, uh, uh, Audible, ACX, and uh, Kindle, and KUP. Um, last night, I, I appeared on the radio show for uh, for these guys, uh, 2600 Magazine. It's the old uh, Hacker Quarterly, one of my favorite old magazines. Um, they put all their energy into figuring out how to be one of the subscription magazines on Kindle. Kindle just unilaterally moved them all into this program called Kindle Unlimited and um, reduced their revenues by like 80% just overnight like that. So that's just a way of transferring a surplus from a, a, a publisher to Amazon because now Amazon can lock more people into the Kindle because uh, they've made all of the products being carried by uh, these creative suppliers like magazine publishers, they've made them cheaper uh, and, and forced those publishers to subsidize it. But it's much worse for independent creative workers, writers who use ACX, which is Audible's self-serve platform or, or use the Kindle platform. Um, Audible is a really important special case here. Audible compo comprises 90% uh, of the audiobook market in most commercially relevant genres. They are truly a monopolist. 
Uh, and Audible is a division of Amazon. Amazon acquired them through an anti-competitive merger in 2008. And Amazon has a, a, a requirement for everyone who sells on Audible that they have to lock their products with Audible's DRM. Even if you don't want it, you have to have it. Unlike, say, the Kindle where you can choose, Audible you cannot choose. You have to have Audible DRM. Every book sold on Audible is locked in perpetuity beyond the expire of its copyright to Audible's platform forever, right? So ACX is Audible's content exchange. It's the self-serve platform for independents and small publishers. They're the people with the least power, the least power to push back. And ACX uh, um, was the nexus of a wage theft scandal called Audiblegate, where Amazon was caught stealing more than $100 million from independent authors. And the reason that they did that or the way that they did that is they said to Audible subscribers who are people who pre-commit to buying a book every month from Audible, which means that they never shop anywhere else. This is very key, right? Remember, locking in users allows them to lock in writers. So they, they have to lock in those users. So they want to promote those, those subscriptions. Um, what they said to them is, you know, we are such good natured slobs that I tell you what, if for any reason you don't like this audiobook, for a whole year after you buy it, you can return it. We'll give you a full credit. You can get another audiobook. Um, that's true. Even if you've listened to it three times over, they know that because they spy on everything you do with audible books. Um, it's true. Even if you leave a positive review for it, they sent people emails, they sent them pop-up messages. They said, just return your audiobooks. This is a very generous thing for, for Amazon to do. And it raises this question, like, how can they afford it? And the answer is they charged it to the authors and then they hid it from them. So what they did was they showed authors net sales figures that didn't include the returns uh, or didn't break out the returns. So what authors saw was that their weekly sales were going from like 50 copies to 40 copies to 30 copies to 10 to five. What they didn't know is they were still selling 50 copies, but by the time they got to five, 45 of them were being returned so that Amazon could make its subscription offer more valuable to its, uh, to its subscribers and make sure that they never shopped anywhere else. Um, and uh, all of this only came to light once there was a kind of data dump where uh, Audible accidentally did three weeks worth of returns in one day. And a bunch of authors woke up and said, how is it that I just sold negative 20 books? I don't know how I sell a negative book. So, um, so you know, this may sound okay if you're the, uh, if you're the reader because you're getting subsidized books if you don't care about the author. I think readers do care about authors. I don't think anyone ever bought a book on Audible because they wanted to make sure that like Jeff Bezos never ran out of penis rockets. But uh, even if you're like the kind of sociopath who's like, I love this art, but the artist can go, you know, hang. Uh, I, I still think that um, those people are getting a worse experience because now Audible is putting ads and audiobooks, right? And again, that's just a way of saying, we know you can't go anywhere else, so we can make the process worse. We can inshitify it. Right, so that's the in shitification life cycle. Surpluses are allocated first to users, then to business customers, then to shareholders. Now, in shitification seeks an equilibrium where not all of the surpluses are transferred to shareholders. You have to leave behind just enough surplus, enough value that the consumers and the producers remain locked in. Otherwise they'll go somewhere else and the business collapses. But this is a very brittle equilibrium. It can be tipped over by uh, a, a very small shock, you know, a privacy scandal, a whistleblower complaint, highly public platform abuses, you know, a live stream mass shooting. It can make people just decide like, you know what, this platform uh, seemed like I couldn't live without it until yesterday. Today, I'm ready to go. This is, you know, what's happening on Twitter right now. And and you can see what happens when the platforms reach the the end of the inshitification process, when they're not disciplined by competition, not disciplined by regulation, have um, this ability to kind of abuse at will their customers and their business users. Um, what they what they end up doing is thrashing. So, you know, Facebook has reinvented itself as a company called Meta, and now it insists that platform users are going to live out the rest of our days as highly surveilled, low resolution, legless, sexless cartoon characters in a metaverse that's named for uh, an idea from an old dystopian science fiction novel. Now, it is okay that platforms collapse. Uh, the focus of our intermediary regulation, the regulation of these platforms, shouldn't be just making the platforms better. It should be protecting platform users from the unshitification cycle. Right now, a lot of our platform regulation is about prolonging the, crepus the crepuscular senescence of these vast platforms as they sink under their own weight. So I'm gonna propose two ways that we can uh, improve the uh, outcomes for platform users without regard to protecting the platforms from their own foolishness. 
Uh, the first one is to restore end-to-end. End-to-end is a very old idea in technological design. It was the underlying principle of the internet. Uh, under an end-to-end system, the job of the network is to deliver packets from willing senders to willing receivers. Unlike, say, the Bell system, where their job was to only connect people if they were willing to pay, only connect people if Bell could figure out how to do it. If you invented caller ID and put a caller ID box on your phone, and then I, um, you gave uh, me a caller ID sending box so that I could put it on my phone, so that I could transmit the fact that it's me if I was calling during dinner and you know to pick up, uh, you couldn't make that work under the Bell system, right? They had to They had to put that in at the central office and charge you money for it. Um, you know, under the under the um, end to end system, you know, I could create Facebook and you could be a Facebook user and your ISP and my ISP just have no insight into what we're doing. They have no ability to stop it, to monetize it, to charge rent for it. Their only job is to deliver packets from willing senders to willing receivers and back again. Um, we do not have end to end at the service level at all. The platforms uh, routinely make it uh, impossible or, or merely very difficult for you to hear from the people you've explicitly asked to hear from. An end-to-end -end principle for platforms would mean that if I subscribe to your feed, then I should see everything you post. If I search for your goods and there's a result in the uh, e-commerce uh, corpus that matches that, that search query, that uh, item should be at the top of the results. If I placed an email from you out of my Gmail spam and mark it as non-spam, all future emails from you should be delivered without going into my spam folder. It was surreal last year to hear Congress debating whether marking unsolicited political fundraising email was spam, or whether that was a form of political censorship. And it ignored the much more salient point, which is that if you ask to hear from your elected representative, there's no way to guarantee delivery of their messages. And indeed, most of their messages are going to end up in your spam folder. Consensual messages should not be blocked by our, our email providers. Now, beyond end to end, there's another part that's really important uh, to trying to uh, uh, protect users from enshittification. And that's uh, what I call the right to exit. Uh, you may have heard about uh, a Mastodon server called Mastodon.lol. They had 12,000 users, and those users got into a huge flame war about the new Harry Potter game. And Nathan, the guy who administered the servers, a volunteer, just hosted these people out of the goodness of his heart. He was like, this is not what I signed up for. I'm going to shut down the server. You guys are all going to have to find somewhere else. Now, that might sound terrible to you. But Mastodon has this very easy mechanism to migrate to another server. You just export the list of your followers and the people you wish to and the people you're following with one click. And then with another click, you import them into any other Mastodon server and they all just move over instantaneously and you're back up and running. Which means that Nathan's 12,000 users have it much better than the 450 million Twitter users who can't leave the platform without losing all their followers and everyone they follow, which would shatter their social network. So the right to exit rule would build on existing data protection laws uh, like the consumer, the California Consumer Protection uh, Act or like uh, the European GDPR that would um, uh, require both large and small platform operators to provide users with machine readable files that they need to reestablish themselves on other platforms. And unlike other regulations that we are trying to impose on platforms like rules about uh, banning lawful but awful content like harassment or hate speech or copyright filter mandates where they have to spend $100 million to filter all user submissions to see if it violates copyright, one of these rules is not a capital moat that prevents new, car, uh, new market entrants, right? It, doing end-to-end -end does not require that you have millions of dollars to comply, which means that only the largest firms can afford to operate. It, it's free, right? If you're just running a Mastodon server, all you have to do is not turn off the export function. Moreover, it is eminently administratable, right? Anytime a Twitter user or one of Nathan's users allege that they weren't provided with data, we don't need a long fact-finding mission where we depose the engineers to figure out whether they're following the rules. We just order Twitter or Nathan to send them another copy of the data. We don't have to create a parallel corporate civil justice system to adjudicate content moderation calls or the decision to ban a user. We just make it easier for end users and business users to take their custom elsewhere. In other words, we could treat bad platform owners as damage and read around them. Now, as I developed this enshittification thesis and started talking about it in public, some people said, you know, this just sounds like rent seeking or fraud or wage theft. 
And I want to say that it's more than that. I want to say that it is a phenomenon endemic to digital platforms. It does share a common root with other competition problems. You know, for 40 years, we have not enforced antitrust. That has changed because the Biden administration appointed some very good trust busters, Lena Khan at the Federal Trade Commission, Jonathan Cantor at the Department of Justice, and other people who work with them. Um, and, and, you know, for 40 years, we did allow anti-competitive mergers and predatory pricing to corral business users and end users and deprive them of alternatives. That's as true of, you know, say professional wrestling where there's only one league or beer where there's only two companies or international shipping where there's only three cartels as it is about the web where there's four giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the, the other three. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and so there are few alternatives on the web, but there are two uniquely digital aspects to enchantification beyond just a failure to enforce antitrust. The first is that platforms are able to twiddle. They can change the platform rules at the click of a mouse. And when you play a shell game, velocity matters. The quickness of the hand is what deceives the eye. So every platform scandal involves high-speed digital maneuvers that just wouldn't be possible in the analog world. You know, think of Jeff Bezos, the grocer who owns uh, Whole Foods. If Jeff Bezos wants to price gouge on eggs, he needs an army of teenagers on roller skates with pricing guns to reprice all the eggs, right? Now think of uh, Jeff Bezos as the grocer who owns Amazon Fresh. When he wants to price gouge on eggs, he just moves a slider. So JP Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, Carnegie, they would have done all this stuff if they could. But, you know, if you're a rail baron hoping to destroy a ferry company, you can't just like lay track in a way that obviates its business overnight. But Amazon can move a slider as it did with diapers.com, which was a company that refused to sell to Amazon. And Amazon just underpriced its diapers, losing $200 million a month by, by selling diapers below cost until diapers.com went into business. They All they had to do was move a slider and the diapers.com went away, which tells us that the platforms, they're not run by evil sorcerers who are hacking our dopamine loops. They're run by ordinary mediocrities using the same repertoire of tricks as their forebears, but they're using computers to do it faster. This is why whenever you see platform users like entertainers doing the kind of Kremlinology, you know, which they used to do in the Soviet Union, where they would just try and read the signs to figure out which political ideologies would get them promoted and which ones would get them sent to a gulag. Today, you have platform users who are doing platform criminology. They're like, oh, don't swear in the first 20 seconds of my YouTube video, or I'll get downranked and I'll get upranked if I use these two primary colors in my thumbnail and so on. It's so frustrating because even though they sometimes are right, sometimes they do kind of controlled, thoughtful experiments to figure out what's going on in the back end, the platform can change it at the flip of a switch uh, with the twiddle of a knob. Now, twiddling isn't all bad. Users can twiddle too, right? You think about ad blockers, the largest boycott in world history. That is users twiddling the browser so that things that the server asked the browser to show them just don't get loaded. Removing DRM, jailbreaking a device, installing an, an alternative app store, that is the user's twiddling. It's the twiddling that seizes the means of computation to claw back value from platform operators. So, for example, publishers who are getting ripped off by Facebook and Google, who had an illegal collusive arrangement called Jedi Blue, where they rigged the ad market so that more than 50% of all the advertising money was going to them and not to uh, the publishers, um, they invented this thing called header bidding, which let them use other exchanges other than Facebooks and Googles to plant their, to place ads on their services, preferentially to Facebook and Google. Um, Google went in and whacked that. They, the Google and Facebook uh, created a program where if they caught you doing that, they just wouldn't, they would, they would rip you off even more. But that was a form of twiddling. So the issue isn't merely that platforms twiddle with every hour that God sends, that they just can't stop touching the knobs. It's that they heard all the twiddling. They use anti-circumvention laws like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. They use terms of service. They use contract claims like tortious interference. They use cybersecurity laws like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. They use patents and they use other legal regimes to erect a kind of shell around what they do that we can call the felony contempt of business model shell. We're doing anything that displeases their shareholders is a literal crime. And that lets them twiddle you and criminalizes any time you twiddle back. 
So to get our internet back, we need to de inshitify it. We need to give up on the council of despair that says that we will never defeat these evil sorcerers in our dopamine loops. And instead, we need to engage with the material, technical, and legal forces that drive inshitification and throw them into reverse. And that means, on the one hand, let's keep doing antitrust, merger scrutiny, structural separation, and other traditional antitrust. There's a new bill in Congress backed by both Ted Cruz and Elizabeth Warren to break up the ad tech giants. That's what I mean by traditional antitrust. But then we need constraints on the ways that platforms twiddle us. Privacy laws, minimum wage laws for gig workers, and other fairness-based rules that keep their fingers off their knobs. And we need to reinvigorate user side twiddling. We need to mandate interoperability. We need to create defenses in law for reverse engineering and for bots and scraping all those things that people do to break out of these, these firms' uh, walled gardens, which are really just walled prisons. Because a world where platforms are not constrained by competition or regulation, a world where they can add as many knobs as they want to the back end and twiddle them all they want, and a world where we are legally prohibited from twiddling back at them is a world where we will inevitably get twiddled to death. So that's my talk. Thank you. <laughs> great, Corey. Uh, horrifying, but great. Uh, uh, I'm going to take a prerogative here before I introduce Steve and, and ask a, a question about what you consider motivation. So. Do these people start out this way? Or, I mean, it seemed like Larry and Sergey had come up with a really useful tool. They were making it available to everybody. Is it just, it's just a natural function over time? Is this greed sets in? Is it capitalism that causes this to happen? Or what do you think is the motivation to so for this? I, I I think that, you know, this is a question about microeconomics and macroeconomics. So macroeconomically, we say to these companies, you have unlimited access to the capital markets. You can buy your competitors, right? So if you're Google and you have one good idea, which is a search engine and no other good ideas, Google has never made a successful product after making a search engine, right? They cloned Hotmail. They made Gmail. Everything else they made in-house was a failure or a clone of someone else's product like, like Chrome, where they use someone else's engine, WebKit, to, to build Chrome. Uh, or it's a product they bought from someone else, right? The YouTube, their entire ad tech stack, their mobile stack, their server management stack, docs, calendaring, everything, uh, an acquisition that we would have prohibited before Ronald Reagan, right? The, 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 this is the change in antitrust law that we're at the end of after 40 years. So what it does is it lets people who are no better than you or me and who have one good idea bargain that idea into a kind of permanent dominance, and they're they're out over their out of their depth, right? Like you can see this now, where they're like, "Oh my God, you know, our search results suck because Google search results really suck these days. We're going to fix them by having a stock buyback and then firing twelve thousand workers whose wages would have been paid for by that stock buyback for the next twenty seven years, and then we're going to take of our remaining workforce, thousands of them, off of the the job, and and devote all of their energies." to replacing search results with florid paragraphs written by a chatbot that doesn't know when it's lying, right? Like this is, these are the actions, this is their version of meta, right? Of, of, of the legless sexless cartoon character bit, right? These are people who had one good idea 25 years ago and have spent the last 25 years wallowing in imposter syndrome as they fail and fail and fail, but continue to succeed by buying other people's successes from them. Right. So that's that's the I think the kind of microeconomics that lives in the macroeconomics. I also think that if you want to think of Google as like a collective enterprise, because it's kind of a mistake to assume that Larry and Sergey are making all the day to day decisions. Although I'll note that if you read the PageRank paper that they published in 1998 describing how Google would work, it opens by saying ad supported search engines will event inevitably suck and you shouldn't support your search engine with ads. So here you have a company where they own 51% of the voting stock and they founded the company by saying, this is the risk that our business faces and they still fell into the trap, which I think tells you that it doesn't really matter what kind of insights the people have because the trap is, is the macroeconomic trap. The microeconomics goes like this. You're sitting around the boardroom table and you say, let's do something that makes things materially worse for our users, but improves our bottom line. If no one around the table can say, well, wait a second, here's the real business cost. This many users can be expected to defect from the service and go to a rival and lower our incomes as a result, then the person with the bad idea always wins. Right. And uh, over time, the bad idea and the bad idea and the bad idea creep in the same way that any any set of compromises 
starts with one little compromise to your principal and then another little compromise that takes you not further from not not is not measured based on where you were before you made the first compromise but is only uh, measured relative to this position you're at now and then you make another little compromise another and another and another and before you know it you're you know running a platform where they live stream mass shootings good take thanks Stephen. take take us out here for you and john yeah, uh, uh, the main thing i was thinking about is if you're talking about intrusification in the eu you've got to translate it into 22 other languages which would be its own sort of exciting exercise um there's a cottage I, I, industry of people translating into french and german and spanish and so on it's it's already underway excellent. I'm I'm glad there's good bottom up stuff. I'm gonna hand over to Jonathan. This is about first actually, is is yeah. John, Jonathan. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Corey, for this great input. Well, speaking, I was thinking also about how to translate to Spanish, because I'm from Mexico, this certification. So I, I guess it will be uh, very interesting. So uh, speaking on monopolization with few companies controlling everything we consume it's hard not to get into some of these companies, even if you don't use them directly. I mean, you can't be on Facebook, but Facebook still has a record on you. And this is, uh, well, I think this is the history of the internet during the last 10 or 20 years, maybe, where big companies buy, buy small and brilliant competitors, eliminating uh, alternative and creating a dependency. So what libraries can do to help correct all the initiativeification, or as you mentioned, to this the initificate and there is also another concept you have worked which i found very interesting which is interoperability and uh, how libraries fit on this idea yeah so um you know you're right that this is not a thing you can solve individually and and some of you may be familiar with the wonderful zephyr teach out that is her real name it's an old quaker name uh she um uh is a law professor she ran for the governor of new york with tim Wu uh as her running mate the, the guy coined the term net neutrality uh and also for attorney general of new york and she um in her book break him up she has this great chapter where she says look this is not about your individual failure to shop your way out of monopoly right that's like definitionally impossible it's like recycling your way out of the climate emergency and you know by all means <clears throat> if you can buy things in a way that supports workers, including creative workers, you should, but don't make it your overwhelming passion. You know, if there's a protest down at your Amazon warehouse over their labor conditions, and you never make it because you spend two hours driving around looking for an artisanal marker shop that uh, won't give the money to, to Amazon, uh, you know, Amazon wins, right? You know, yeah, you, you, you might have eventually made your protest sign without giving a nickel to Amazon, but you missed the protest. And so you gotta focus on these things as systemic problems and not individual problems. And um, you know, I, I think that um, in the case of libraries, because they are institutionally so important uh, and, and do enjoy so much public support, notwithstanding some loud anti-democratic, you know, terrified projecting homophobes um, that, that you know, this is a place where when you are offered a bad deal, when all the publishers offer you a bad deal, when all the distributors offer you a bad deal, when a distributor buys another distributor and zeroes out your choice to just one firm, this is an area where you should be through your professional associations, including if you're a state library through, through the state library apparatus, going to your attorney general, your state attorney general. AG stands for aspiring governor. And these antitrust cases are incredibly attractive to AGs um, because they produce huge fines, which fund the AG's office. This is why the Texas AG is uh, leading, who's a terrible person, Ken Paxton, but he's leading the antitrust charge against Google. I don't think he gives a damn about Google, but I do think he likes the idea of taking a giant chunk of a trillion dollar company and allocating it to his state coffers. So, you know, this is an area where you have a confluence of interest. Um, the other thing about, uh, about these circumstances is that they are intrinsically unstable, right? Uh, as Stein's law has it, anything that can't go on forever eventually stops. And so um, we lurch from crisis to crisis in the area of competition, particularly in, in books and libraries. Uh, you can see this happening with the Internet Archive right now. 
also with respect to publishing and tech you know there's the jcpa about to be reintroduced in congress that's a tax on links so if you're facebook or google you have to pay a tax to let your users link to news stories it's a terrible way to to run this these are moments where as the crisis arises if we are already talking about and demanding solutions through our professional associations through our groups to our patrons if we're if we're already um saying you know how about if instead of paying a tax on links, we reform the ad tech industry, right? We back this ad, te ad tech breakup bill, which will drop the amount of money going to publishers, uh, for the, the amount of money of the, owed to the publishers going to big tech from 50% to 10% and give them 40% more money on all the advertising that they run. Or how about if we break the app store duopoly, which takes 30% of every dollar earned through the app stores, which would give the publishers an extra 30% on every subscriber they have without adding another subscriber, right? Like that's the kind of thing where we can move in at these moments where they're saying, well, there is a definite problem. It's a real problem. I think the problems of big tech and media are real. Um, and here's this completely bogus, absurd solution that won't make things any better. We can step in and say, here's this other idea that we've been talking about for years, that we've had speakers on, that our organization has published articles about, that, you know, there's a working group to support, that there's model legislation, that there's, you know, like that this is an idea that people support. How about if we do this instead? How about if we do something that works instead of just something that is easy? And so I, I think that's how you advance this these solutions that you don't do it um, by doing it as an individual. You have to think of it as a long run systemic progr program. I mean, the, the forces that gave us monopoly are a long run systemic force, right? That's that they, they got here through long run patient planning. And, you know, this brings me to the final piece I'll say about my theory of change here. So back in the 1960s and early 1970s, Milton Friedman, who is the architect of neoliberal economics, he was at the University of Chicago School of Economics, and he's really the person most directly responsible for our current economic system, its monopolies, its woes, its inequality, and its corruption, as well as the destruction of the planet. Um, he was fighting against the New Deal and um, the uh, benefits that had come as a result of it, where an unprecedented but uneven uh, a group of Americans had experienced access to prosperity and social mobility that their um, forebears had not. It was not racially equal. It had gaps in its gender and gender expression stuff. But all of that was like part of the movement post, post New Deal. You know, it's where feminism, black liberation, civil rights movement, they all come out of that, even if they were laggards and the transfer of wealth to white working class people, they were also in the in train. And so people liked the Great Society. They liked the New Deal. They liked social mobility. They liked sending their kids to college. They liked owning their own homes. They liked being able to take vacations. They liked having health care. They liked those things. And Milton Friedman wanted to get rid of them. And people said, Milton, how are you going to convince people to get rid of these things that they like? How are you going to convince them to, get, to, to do something that makes their lives significantly materially worse? And he said, look, when crisis strikes, and there will always be a crisis because even if we do everything perfectly, there will be wars, oil shocks, meteor strikes, pandemics, you name it, some crisis will happen eventually. When that crisis strikes, ideas lying around move from the fringe to the center. And we are in a period of polycrisis, as John said at the beginning of this, of this session, right, where, where we have crisis piled upon crisis piled upon crisis every day, a new crisis. When those crises strike, if we have developed our ideas at the fringe, those ideas lying around will move rapidly to the center if we if we push them there. And so this is the theory of change. Thank you, Corey. Well, I would like to highlight this idea of think of strategies as a long systemic program. And speaking of crisis, there is a topic that is of the interest of libraries. And I, I would like to hear your idea on this, which is disinformation. You know that over the last decade, we have seen an increasing lack of trust in media, in government, in science, and cultural institutions. And many social events have powered this. Since 2016, the media have mentioned that we live in the post-truth era. And then with the pandemic uh, came the so-called infodemic or disinfodemics. And many other terms involving the trinomial information, 
technology and health. We have a lot of these. And we have seen a wide range of responses to this information from policy and legislative measures to technological efforts and media and education literacy initiative from libraries, of course. Um, there is also this approach I heard from you to first fix the companies, you know, forcing social media or giant social media to fight this information. But I guess it is more complex than that. So with the rise of artificial intelligence, we have now more accurate deep fakes, uh, more creative ideas from conspiracy theories. And as a result, we have more fragmented societies. So what's your opinion on this problem? And how do you envision the disinformation landscape in the medium term of 10 years? So the, the critic Lee Vinsel, he's got this term, he says, he calls it crita hype. Um, and crita hype is when you criticize something but hype it up at the same time by, by um, uh, taking its claims at face value. So, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and his friends in the ad tech industry, they invented all this nonsense about hacking dopamine loops. And what they're basically claiming is that they created a mind control ray. And there's a reason that if you're selling advertising, you want to tell people that you, you invented a mind control ray because lots of advertisers would like to be able to convince people to buy their stuff. And so you say to them, you should pay extra to, to buy stuff with us because, you know, we have big data and, and, and data mining and artificial intelligence and we can you know, uh, make people believe that up is down and left is right. Uh, and so when we go out there and we say, oh, look, Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg built a mind control ray to sell your nephew a fidget spinner, and then Vladimir Putin stole it and made your uncle into a QAnon, we're actually helping Mark Zuckerberg sell ads. Everyone who ever claimed to have a mind control ray was lying to themselves or everyone else or both. That's true of Rasputin. It's true of Mesmer. It's true of people who believe in neuro-linguistic programming, pickup artists, uh, CIA and MK Ultra, all of them either deluded or con artists or both. Uh, I think that we should look for more, more parsimonious explanations, simpler explanations for how it is that people end up believing in outlandish things as a result of uh, what they see on big tech. And I think that the most obvious one is that if you have, uh, if you are willing to believe conspiratorial accounts of institutional failure, then it's a, a, a great correlate of that is that you live in an inst in a place where the institutions have previously failed you, right? So when people say, "I don't believe in vaccines because the pharmaceutical companies are run by sociopath billionaires who don't care who they kill so long as they make a profit." And the regulators who are supposed to be holding them to account are no better and they're enthralled to them. You know, that's not wrong, right? I, I, I have a chronic pain problem. I mentioned I got these two artificial hips. I went to see a doctor 10 years ago and he said, why don't you just take opioids for the rest of your life? There's new research. They're super safe. You should, you should just take opioids. Everyone should take opioids. They're great, right? I did my own research, right? I went online and I concluded that there was a conspiracy by the Sackler family, sociopath billionaires who had their name on a bunch of public buildings, including maybe some of your libraries, along with the FDA and their other watchdogs who were colluding to kill people so that they could get rich. 800,000 dead Americans later, I think I've been vindicated. And I have to tell you, as someone who's not a cell bi a biologist or a virologist or, a or an addiction researcher, I can't tell you why I trust vaccines as a scientific matter. I do. I am fully vaxxed. I spent a day on the sofa last week after my second shingles vaccine. Once again, I'm an old person. But uh, I, um, uh, as an epistemological matter, my belief in uh, vaccines is no more or less coherent than my disbelief in opioids. And I'm not saying that we can't do anything about conspiratorial belief until we reform all of our institutions. But I am saying that the emphasis on trying to make people more rational when there is in fact a rational basis for mistrusting institutions and the failure to focus on improving the quality of our institutions, right? To make them more responsive, to um, uh, close, to end the revolving door between government and industry, to um, end the monopolization of our sectors. You know, one of the things that monopolies do is they change our regulatory questions from truth-seeking exercises to auctions. You know, and there's a hundred companies in a sector, say if there were a hundred ISPs in America, and you said, should we 
have net neutrality. You know, the FCC opens this question, opens a docket, notice of inquiry, notice of proposed rulemaking. The input that they would get, half of it would come from ISPs that were like, they advertise that they are the neutral ISP that will give you the packets you ask for as quickly as they can. The other half will come from ones who have a story about why you should only see the packets that are most profitable to them because it makes network management better, right? And you will get evidence from the ISPs that are that are running a clean operation, a neutral operation, will say, there is no network management issue here. Look, here's our network logs. Here's our, here's our uptime. Here's our stats, right? And the other side will say, no, 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 you're wrong. And you will have an adversarial truth-seeking exercise in a public forum that will be adjudicated by a neutral expert. Because the thing is, if there are 100 ISPs, there will be lots of people who understand how the ISPs work who aren't executives from ISPs. When there's three Everyone who works at an who understands how the ISPs work works for an ISP. So imagine there's three or five or seven ISPs as we have now in America. When you ask about net neutrality, they all show up and sing from the same playbook. In fact, they all know each other. I mean, you may remember John Legere who uh, took over T-Mobile and called himself the un CEO of the un phone company. John Legere was a lifetime executive at Sprint and AT&T. The idea that he was an industry outsider is laughable on its face. There are no industry outsiders in the upper echelons of the telecoms industry. They all know each other. They're godparents to each other's children. They walk each other down the aisle. They, they're executors of each other's estates. They get together at Passover and Easter. They know each other. And so when they show up, asked uh, whether or not we should have network neutrality, they're like, nope. We should definitely not have network neutrality. And the only people saying anything otherwise is uh, some academics or people who run little community ISPs that can be safely ignored, right? So the reason our policy sucks is because of monopoly, right? So like if we're not ever going to bring in the material conditions that lead to conspiratorial accounts of the world and we focus on conspiratorialism as a kind of contagion, which, you know, I think it is in the sense that, like, if you think that the world is really screwed up and someone comes to you and says it's because of the Jewish bankers or whatever, you may already have been kind of an anti-Semite. You may already um, have been, you know, prone to conspiratorial beliefs. But the thing that makes that most plausible, the convincer there, is that you live in a world where the institutions have materially failed and you are looking for an account of it and no one will give you an account that isn't conspiratorial. In fact, when you have a political contest as we did in 2016, where someone goes out and says the system is rigged, you have you have their political opponent who says, no, the, <clears throat> the system isn't rigged. America was always great, right? What, what an idiotic slogan, right? Like, like nobody should ever be given an opportunity to run for office whose slogan is America was always great, because that is a way to make sure that no matter what your opponent is saying, lots of people will vote for them because at least they're saying something is wrong. And if you're saying nothing is wrong and all the problems you're having is, are your fault, then um, everyone who has a problem isn't going to vote for you, right? So so that I think is the is the way to understand conspiratorialism. When people see a deep fake of a politician conspiring to child traffic in a world in which Jeffrey Epstein operated with absolute impunity and his his uh, co-conspirators are still today running around going to Met Galas and so on, we should really consider the role that that impunity plays in making the deep fake plausible. Because a deep fake in which a politician says, I just, you know, um, up is down, left is right, black is white, uh, and I'm secretly from Mars, that is not going to get the traction that a deep fake that says uh, rich elites are colluding to abuse children with impunity because we know that rich elites did collude to abuse children with impunity. Like that is an incontrovertible fact. And so, you know, the swivel-eyed loons have a point is what I'm saying here. And... Um, you know, when we focus on conspiratorialism as an ideological matter, uh, instead of as a material, as a downstream of material conditions, um, we will never be able to fix uh, conspiratorialism. We will just end up saying like, you know, can you please just stop believing in the things that your lived experience tells you is true? And, and that's just a losing battle. It's a tough one. Uh, Corey... <laughs> 
one one of the arguments against uh, busting up uh, these uh, monopolists is it advantages China, the competitors of China. It's treated as sort of a closed system. It's a U.S. and the West or something like that. Uh, the Europeans are doing a lot or a lot more anyway than the U.S. regulators, but you still get this answer. Well, then the Chinese will just simply take over if we if you undermine our ability to, to you know to to operate. So, what do you say to that? Okay, well, for sixty nine years, the Department of Justice tried to break up AT and T. In nineteen eighty two, they managed it, and at the time that they broke up AT and T, the um, American business lobby had this line. They said AT and T is America's bulwark that defends us against an authoritarian Far Eastern Asian state that steals our intellectual property, um, is, was our military adversary and living memory, and wants to um, uh, take over America and destroy our high tech industry. That, that country was Japan. Uh, it turned out that what AT&T was really doing was kneeling on the chest of the American tech industry because AT&T's major project was preventing the spread of modems and and preventing the rise of of end to end because what they wanted was for every service provided over its wires to generate rents for AT&T and for things that competed with its service notably long distance which today we don't have long distance calls here we are on a long distance call that costs nothing um they wanted those to remain a money spinner for them uh today 40 years later you would have to be just an idiot to argue that breaking up AT&T was bad for the American uh, uh, political project on the world stage. There is nothing that projected more American power abroad than breaking up AT&T. China does not act like Baidu and its other tech companies are its national champions. Xi Jinping is rounding up their top executives and sticking them in gulags, right? Uh, that tells you that Xi Jinping firmly believes that the, that the interests that these firms project outside of China's borders are their shareholders and not the, not the firms themselves. So when, you know, sellouts like Nick Clegg, who is the deputy prime minister in the United Kingdom, now gets $4 million a year to front Facebook around the world to his former colleagues in politics, when he says we have to keep European cyberspace sovereign from China, and that's why we can't break up Facebook, he is uh, lying. He has been paid $4 million to lie. I don't think he believes it. Uh, I think that Nick Clegg is representing Facebook, not Europe. I think that Eric Schmidt represents Google, not America. I think that uh, Peter Thiel represents Peter Thiel, not America. I don't think that um, the uh, uh, threat to American cyberspace is Chinese tech companies. I think the threat to American cyberspace is American monopolies that uh, make Chinese companies more attractive. I mean, it's amazing to think that the uh, we finally saw some breakage of the Facebook Google deadlock and it came from China. That That is not a, uh, uh, a scary thing about China. It is an indictment of the sluggishness and lack of innovation in American tech, which has spent every hour that God sent for the last 20 years figuring how to generate a uh, half a percent more clicks on ads instead of making products that people love. They need the discipline of competition and regulation. Um, they, are, they are in no way our friends, not least because all of these businesses rely on and act as cover for the data broker industry, right? The Facebook and Google, they gather a lot of data on you as primary um, uh, data collectors, but they are among the most prolific consumers of commercial data broker data, which they merge with the data that they collect on you. And they and the data broker industry have done everything they could to prevent a federal privacy law from passing in America. If you were to ban TikTok tomorrow, China could just put a credit card down with those data brokers and gather all the same data they're gathering from, from TikTok, right? I mean, you know, if we're worried about people being targeted by foreign actors, let's make our tech companies stop gathering data on us. And to do that, we have to make them weaker because right now they're too powerful. Fair point. Um, we're, uh, uh, it's time to close out here, uh, but since, since we're a group uh, of librarians here and you're surrounded by books and books are kind of where this all started, uh, I want to just ask you for 
some book recommendations uh, in science fiction. You have some favorite uh, uh, books out there today you can put for us and close us out. Well, I pasted this into the chat before. I'm going to paste it again. Whoops, sorry, that's the wrong paste. That's a bunch of years. Uh, sorry, here we go. Uh, this is uh, all my reviews from the last three years. Uh, uh, in terms of um, science fiction I've read recently that I've enjoyed, uh, I really like Ruth Anna Emrys's A Half Built A Half Built Garden. I thought that was a superb uh, novel. It really, um, it, you know, if you're interested in the role that uh, you know statistical inference engines can play in deliberation and in kind of um, you know summarizing the the substance of a debate and allowing lots of people to deliberate together as well as what um, a post climate emergency world where we de dedicated ourselves to addressing the emergency instead of outrunning it or ignoring it, where the emergency was still unfolding, but we were actually engaged with it, as well as just a cracking first contact uh, alien space adventure. Uh, Ruthann Amherst's Half Built Garden, I think is a, a superb book. I, I strongly recommend it. Right. Okay, let's um, let's wrap this up. Let's close the recording here. We don't. Uh, this is not a TV program. We're not hemmed in by uh, arbitrary time. But uh, let's uh, let's thank everybody. Um, if we were together, we would give you a round of applause. Uh, but I'll just Can have to do it on thing, behalf of everybody. Dylan Dylan raises yes, a great point here in the chat. I oh. uh, none of my books are for sale on Audible because Audible won't carry them without DRM, which means that I have to kickstart them i'm running a kickstarter you can go to redteamblues.com uh, uh to pre-order that audiobook i got to the studio last week will wheaton recorded it he did a superb job it's just amazing it's sold drm free um it is sold drm free without terms of service you can integrate it into your library collection uh uh you don't have to pay outrageous audiobook prices you just pay the 20 bucks and then it's in your library collection for your patrons you can get it for yourself too uh, I think that having these Kickstarters do really well is the first step to convincing a critical mass of authors to demand better of Audible. Very good. Th thank you, Dylan. Uh, all right. Well, with that, we'll close the recording. Uh, and thank you, Corey and Stephen and, and Jonathan, all of you. So that's going to conclude. We won't be on next week, but the week after we'll be back with exciting new content. Thank, thank you, you for having me on.